motion using uh, you know, spin motion rather than uh, you know, charge motion. By the way, this is the semiconductor chip. And I started my career as a circuit designer right after my bachelor degree. And uh, 20 years ago, uh, this was 50 megahertz, uh, you know, state of the art technology at that time. But now you look at your CPU in your computer, it's like three gigahertz. So you can see about 100 times, you know, enhancement in terms of speed. So what will happen after 20 years from now on? What will be the speed? Or, you know, is it possible for us to move, you know, three gigahertz to 300 gigahertz in 20 years? How do you think? I think it's very challenging. Yeah? And a lot of people in CMOS, you know, often talk about we already limit, you know, reach the limit of, uh, uh, you know, the radar scale, you know, scaling. So that's why I think this spintronics offer kind of a new direction, you know, what we can do, uh, you know, using uh, spin information. So if you look at this individual transistor and interconnect, we consume a lot of energy due to charging and discharging of electrons. Uh, and we want to move to, for example, spin transistors or uh, interconnect we can replace by uh, spin waves. Is it possible? I think it's a very interesting research area. Uh, on the other hand, this uh, magnetic tunnel junction based uh, magnetic random access memory was already commercialized. You can buy from Everspin. Two months ago, Samsung also announced mass production and they shipped to Sony, which I'm going to introduce later on. So if you look at this uh, uh, MRAM die, and uh, most of these uh, uh, random access memory use cross-point architecture, so-called, and then you can see word line and bit line crossing each other at the junction, you have one bit of cell. And once we amplify those, one bit is a sandwich structure, so-called magnetic tunnel junction. So we have two magnetic layer. In the middle, we have insulator. Mostly these days, we use uh, magnesium oxide because of the spin filtering effect. If two magnetic layers are pointing same direction, we have high current, one of the layer flipped, this is called anti-parallel configuration. We have low current. So we can constitute digital information zero and one. So this is a foundation how we can store, you know, basically zero and one. So what will be the future direction of this uh, magnetic tunnel junction based applications? Uh, we can replace e-flash in smart card, or even we can imagine, you know, SRAM replacement, so-called L3 cache. So basically this is a CPU memory, uh, but we wanna, you know, replace those using a non-volatile, even wearable, you know, you can see a lot of applications, biocompatible in the future and so on. So uh, my group, we've been trying to understand what is the strain effect in this uh, magnetic tunnel junction last uh, quite a number of years. So first we use uh, diamond-like carbon. So this is called DLC. Uh, and this is a very interesting and important material in hard disk drives. I'm, I'm pretty sure later in this afternoon, you will learn about this material. Um, then we incorporate this material on top of our MTJ, and uh, this material is known to have a very compressive strain, right? So you can basically uh, push, you know, uh, your MTJs in retro direction, and what we found is the, this TMR value is quenched once we put this DLC on top of our uh, device. So this was rather discouraging because we always want to improve TMR, but this one, in fact, reduced TMR. Then naively we thought, uh, if we can somehow give a tensile strain, we can, if we can stretch out, uh, probably we can improve the TMR. And then I talked to many material scientists. Do you know any materials we can you know, give a tensile stress? And I was found it's not very easy. So then we made uh, you know, university types of you know, crude uh, um, mechanical stage. You have a uh, sort of rotation stage and this uh, bullet will move up and down depending on rotation. Then we put our wafer there and then you can basically give mechanical you know, uh, stress there. Uh, so once you have uh, your uh, magnetic tunnel junction on top of this wafer, basically you can sort of it's stretch out. Then we rotate this uh, screw as a function of you know, fine angle. Then we found the magnetic tunnel junction, uh, TMR value can enhance from 120% uh, even up to 220, 260%. And it's uh, quite uh, repeatable. Uh, so this really shows a uh, you know, possibility we can uh, give a, a tensile stress, then we can improve TMR. So th that really confirmed our uh, you know, uh, initial idea. So recently we tried to make uh, fully uh, flexible MTJs and initially we tried to deposit on top of piezo substrate or plastic substrate, all failed because most of the real materials are very rough. Uh, then recently, 
you know, discovered this MGO requires only one nanometer, you know, a very flat layer. Uh, so it's not very easy, you know, to deposit directly on a very rough surface. Uh, so we just deposit on a, a conventional silicon wafer, then we can etch out the handling wafer, uh, then those MTJ will be very thin suspended layer, then using a stamping technique using uh, PDMS, this is just the typical, you know, your rubber eraser, uh, you can just Attach and then move to any uh, foreign substrate, like this is a plastic substrate. So during this process, if you look at the lattice constant, there is an in, in, you know, in, interesting behavior. If you look at this uh, initial uh, lattice of MTJ and then final one, you notice uh, there is uh, uh, stress uh, on the lateral direction. This is due to the compressive stray, strain initially given by this uh, silicon oxide. Silicon oxide, people typically you know, think this is amaprost and uh, probably no stress, but in fact it's not. It acts, gives a compressive stress. But once you release your underlying silicon substrate, then this silicon oxide can be stretched laterally, and then eventually your MTJ can be also stretched to laterally. So then we can see interesting effect. Once we have a you know, tensile stress, we expect enhancement of PMR. So in fact, this uh, was observed uh, if you look at on top of a silicon, we have a black curve as a function of TMR and magnetic field. But as soon as we move this guy on a, a plastic substrate, you can see the TMR improved immediately. And then also the loop response uh, became much you know, square. This square behavior is known as a magnetostriction. So once you have magnetic domain and you stretch, what happened? Your magnetic domain aligned better in one direction then uh, your magnetic response will be more ab abrupt. So that's what happened, this uh, very abrupt response. But uh, the enhancement of TMR uh, cannot be understood using this uh, conventional magnetostriction uh, you know, theory. So we tried to understand what is going on. Uh, we had a collaboration with Professor Mark Says in Ghent. So he did uh, K-resolved uh, transmission calculation. So basically this is a quantum mechanical transmission you know, probability calculation. In parallel alignment, when two magnetic electrodes are pointing the same direction, uh, there's not much change regardless of ten, you know, tensile or compressive strain. This is a particular feature of uh, MGO. This uh, tunnel barrier is, is very robust against uh, in any disturbance in case of uh, parallel alignment, not like uh, in aluminum oxide. But if you now make anti-parallel alignment, so you flip one of the magnetic electrodes, and then we apply different types of stress, and you can see from the initial configuration, once we give a tensile stress, the transmission probability decrease. So if we have a less transmission, basically the resistance of anti-parallel will increase. And then your TMR will increase eventually. So in case of a tensile, basically we will increase TMR, but in case of compressive strain, we will decrease the TMR. So this is the underlying uh, principle, how we can you know, give a, a sort of a strain engineering in uh, magnetic tunnel junction. We can, in fact, move uh, this uh, array of MTJs to any foreign substrate. This is an example of glass. You can see many arrays uh, of MTJs. Uh, it's difficult to see. This is aluminum foil, PDMS, nitrogen glove. Uh, recently, my student, you know, was able to move even on our cloth or paper and no restriction. And once we move, uh, this is an example of aluminum foil, we can measure the TMR very carefully because you can easily punch through this whole, you know, structure with your uh, proof station needle. Uh, and you can see the TMR response is more than, you know, 220% uh, and very square response and so on. So the uh, junction property is uh, maintained without any degradation. So I hope this uh, you know, gives some kind of proof of concept, the magnetic tunnel junction or even you know, MTJ-based sensors uh, you know, can be applicable, wearable, or you know, flexible uh, electronics applications in the future. So once we have this very you know, established MTJs, now industry people can make you know, much better than typical university laboratory. That's how they commercialize this technology. So initially this uh, magnetic random access memory was uh, uh, you know, uh, released by Everspin using Togger MNAM. So this is no more than you know, simple magnetic field based switching. So you have to apply large you know, charge current and generate the fringing field to switch your uh, information storage free layer. Uh, 
and then later on, uh, you know, people uh, spent uh, quite the time to understand this uh, spin transfer torque uh, phenomena in which we can just inject charge current into the junction and depending on the charge current, you can switch one to the other layer. So as you can see, the, you know, the structure architecture is very simplified compared to this field-based switching. So that's why all the major companies are now investigating you know, how to commercialize this STP technology. And the last year, IBM announced uh, Everspin-based STT MRAM on top of their flash core module uh, so they can improve the system performance. Uh, last a few years also, uh, Everspin with the global founder in Singapore, they you know, produce these sampling chips and ship to many uh, system integration uh, companies. Uh, and two months ago, Samsung uh, mass produced this uh, 28 nanometer based embedded uh, MRAM. Uh, then they shipped to the, some customers in Japan. So I think now we start to see uh, more and more real application using this uh, STT MRAM. And as time goes, I expect uh, more and more, you know, uh, consumer electronics will come and we will enjoy some kind of, uh, you know, uh, boost in uh, system performance and probably new experience uh, even. So as academia, we have to think about now, what will be the future direction of this uh, MRAM? How we can improve or what can we do? So nowadays, probably you heard about a lot about this uh, spin orbit torque uh, MRAM. So that's the, one of the topic I'm gonna introduce today. So as uh, Professor Lee uh, explained, what is uh, spin orbit coupling? Probably I don't need to show, uh, but typically this is the slide I want to show to the first year graduate students. Uh, you know, to easily understand. Uh, if you have a rotation ball, okay, and then initially this ball is moving in this direction, but if you look at the relative velocity at this point and this point, you have a different relative velocity because of spinning, and uh, this ball will deflect in this direction because of this uh, rotation. If you rotate in opposite direction, this ball will move to the other direction. So this is basically the, the deflection can be considered as, uh, you know, spin current and uh, the initial ball motion is charge current and the rotation axis uh, can be considered as spin polarization uh, direction. For example, if you rotate this ball in this way, uh, then the rotation axis is in parallel with this uh, uh, initial ball motion direction, then what will happen? This ball will not deflect, it will move straight because uh, the spin polarization and charge current direction is in parallel. So as uh, Professor Lee explained, these all three components should be orthogonal each other to see this interesting behavior. So exactly the same thing happened in a solid. If you have a spin polarization, you know, uh, electrons will deflect in one to the other, depending on spin polarization direction. So this uh, behavior first uh, discussed by Professor Diagonov in 1971, uh, and uh, like a typical big discovery, nobody paid attention for a long time until 1999 and Hirsch, sort of revisited uh, about this phenomena and then uh, you know, extensively discussed by uh, many other uh, you know, scientists and engineers. Experimentally, uh, Genichop in 2002 showed the uh, spin galvanic effect, so in which he shined uh, circular polarized light in gallium arsenide and measure charge current. Uh, in a metal, um, you know, Venezuela and Saito used the inverse spin or effect in platinum, uh, so then they inject the spin current and measure uh, charge current. So that is the, basically the history of this field. So depending on the um, origin, we typically discuss into two uh, major phenomena. One is a spin or effect. As uh, previous speaker explained, this is coming from Burke and typically quantified by this theta, which is a proportional constant between the injected charge current and the spin current. So obviously we want to have a larger value in this theta. The other one is a uh, uh, Lashiba Edelstein effect is coming from the you know broken symmetry uh, interfacial effect. Uh, so the easy way to understand this at, at the interface, uh, once you have a semiconductor and metal, you have uh, electric field due to work function difference. Then the moving electron feels uh, this electric field as if magnetic field. Uh, so this effective magnetic field can give you uh, basically the uh, polarized uh, spin accumulation. So that's a very simple way to understand this phenomenon. But in reality, what happened? If you look at this uh, structure, we always have under, underlying substrate. So then you have substrate and your material, and you will have interface. If you have interface, you have this phenomenon. 
Now, if you look at the top, your sample has a vacuum interface. So then you also have some kind of lush by effect here. So in reality, it's not easy to distinguish in real material system, always sort of coexist. And scientifically, of course, it's you know, interesting uh, to distinguish how much percentage is coming from this, how much percentage is coming from this, whether those two guys you know, have the same direction, same sign or opposite sign. Uh, so I think those are all very interesting uh, topic, you know, I think for you guys can uh, study. So imaging is believing, as he also introduced uh, this uh, Santa Barbara show, very beautiful imaging, uh, depending on the spin direction. And indeed, uh, you know, up spin and down spin separated in both edges, and we can see those. This measurement is very easy to repeat in semiconductor, but it's very difficult to repeat in a metal. And in fact, nobody showed uh, this image in a metal because the background you know, carrier density is so much in a metal. So even though you generate extra spin polarized carriers, it's not easy to measure those delta. So we try to uh, make a new uh, setup called the scanning photovoltage microscope. Um, so we pattern uh, as a kind of whole bar structure and uh, uh, we can shine circular polarized lights, right hand, left hand, and typical magnetic material has a so-called magnetic circular dichroism. Depending on uh, um, polarization, the, the amount of absorption is different. And uh, we can define the photovoltage in longitudinal direction. If the material is not spin polarized, basically the right hand, left hand, you know, polarized light will be absorbed equal amount. So this uh, photovoltage will be zero. But if there is any preferred spin polarization, basically the absorption will be spin dependent or polarization dependent, then either we will have a positive or negative uh, this voltage. So depending on uh, the voltage sign, we can determine what is the local spin accumulation direction. So this is the principle. Then we have a PHO sample stage and you can move around and eventually you can make a two dimensional mapping. So we apply this one into a, a very well known metal like platinum. So this is top view from the channel and you apply zero current. Obviously nothing should happen because there's no charge current, uh, there's no spin current. Then we increase the amount of charge current, three milliamps. You can see a little bit some, you know, um, bluish and the reddish. Six milliamp, you can see very clear uh, blue and red, uh, which indicate uh, uh, in down and up spin so accumulated in opposite interface. Once we flip the current direction, uh, exactly, the spin accumulation flip the sign. So you can see uh, red and blue. We can also use in a semiconductor, this is a bismuth selenide. Nowadays people call it as a topologic insulator, but it's simply a low band gap semiconductor. And zero charge current, nothing happens. And you can see one milliamps so blue and red, and minus one and red and blue, so it flips. So exactly this is a current induced phenomena because the intensity proportional with the current and then also the sign change depending on the current direction. And this technique is applicable in both semiconductor and metal. And uh, especially in metal, it's not very easy to get those image, but this technique seems to be more sensitive compared to the conventional magnetic optical curl imaging technique. And this is also intrinsic measurement with only single material. You don't have to have a ferromagnet. So typically you have to have a bilayer and measure torque. Okay. But in this case, you have a single material you develop in a laboratory, you deposit some you know, interesting material. You want to know whether my material can generate you know, spin current. Uh, then you just need to shine polarized light and subtract the voltage. So this is, I think, relatively easy and uh, more intuitive measurement. Uh, but of course, once you have this uh, spin accumulation, we want to utilize those. Uh, then we attach ferromagnet on top and we want to manipulate those. And uh, of course, the underlying uh, you know, principle could be either a bulk spin hole or interfacial lash by effect. But again, it's not very easy to distinguish. And the first seminar work was uh, demonstrated by uh, Mihai and uh, Pietro Gambadella. Uh, in 2011, so they use a cobalt platinum bilayer. Once you flow uh, charge current in platinum, you can switch cobalt from top to bottom or bottom to top, depending on charge current direction. But in this case, 
because your accumulated spin in the middle of the channel is in plane, orthogonal to the current direction. Basically, typically we call this is Y spin. So uh, your perpendicular spin you know, is orthogonal to each other. So you have to break the symmetry. So you have to apply external magnetic field to have a deterministic switching. So that is one of the limitation in current spin orbital engineering field. In order to switch PMA, we have to have external magnetic field. And obviously, this is a bottleneck for real application. And followed by the Cornell work uh, in 2012, they used uh, tantalum and the cobalt boron, and they were able to show a switching from left to right, or right to left, depending on the uh, current direction. But in this case, the accumulated spin is collinear with the magnetization direction of cobalt boron. So you don't need to have uh, external field. But obviously, for nowadays application, everything moved toward a perpendicular system. You know, hard disk first, then even MRAM is all now utilizing perpendicular uh, magnetic anisotropy. So this geometry is preferred, but you need the external field. So how do we quantify then the torque experienced by a ferromagnet? Uh, one of the established methods is a so-called second harmonic technique. It's first proposed by uh, in this paper from Samsung, Dr. P. Uh, then later in 2013, uh, three groups uh, you know, developed more refined measurement independently. Uh, my group used more larger field uh, measurements, so you can uh, even uh, extract the uh, anisotropy field and so on. Uh, and the other group uh, focused the small field linear regime, and you can fit uh, those, and we can extract the effective uh, magnetic field you know, coming from this uh, spin orbital. The other quantity also we want to know is uh, this uh, spin or angle. This is all effective number because what you are measuring is sort of all entangled uh, number. And the effective spin or angle is uh, by definition the uh, spin conductivity in this uh, vertical direction divided by charge conductivity injected into device. But if you uh, write down the spin current over charge current, we have very interesting enhancement factor L over T multiplied by a spin or angle. L is device length and T is device thickness. And typically L is much larger than T in our modern geometry. So eventually your spin current over charge current, the ratio can be quite large because of this enhancement factor. And this you know, can be understood as a lateral scattering idea. Once you inject one electron, this electron can give a torque but there is no electromotive force in the vertical dimension. So this electron cannot you know, go forever. It should come back and then it can give a torque again. So you, know, you can have a multiple sort of uh, scattering at this interface. So it can you know, generate multiple torques. But on the other hand, if you look at the conventional STT, you inject the electron, it can be utilized only one time and then it should exit to the electrode. So this is vertical geometry you know, as a limitation in terms of the electron sort of you know, scattering. And those two components, uh, effective spin or angle and the SOT effective field has some kind of linear relationship. So again, the bottom line is we want to increase those guys number as, as much as possible uh, because that will eliminate, you know, I mean, decrease the switching current uh, eventually. How do we quantify this uh, spin or angle? Uh, uh, the established method is uh, spin torque ferromagnetic resonance. So on top of conventional FMR, uh, we have additional these two torque terms. Uh, one is uh, longitudinal and the other one is transverse torque terms due to uh, SOT. Then once you measure uh, the uh, DC electrification voltage as a, a function of magnetic field, you have those, uh, you know, the electrified DC voltage, then we can decompose into symmetric and uh, anti-symmetric component. And basically the, uh, the intensity of those two uh, can be compared and then you can extract the spin or angle value. The other quick way to uh, estimate the spin or angle is just look at you know, current induced switching. So in a conventional hole bar, uh, we can induce the charge current and switch one of the uh, perpendicular magnet on top. And we measure anomalous hole voltage to look at the switching. This is one of the example of uh, with the platinum, you can see clockwise switching with uh, a switching current with about one milliamps. In case of tantalum, you can see anti-clockwise switching and switching current is 0 0.2. So obviously, you know, you can now see, oh, you know, the sign is opposite because the effective spin or angle uh, have opposite signs in platinum and tantalum. 
but also you can see the uh, switching current is much smaller in case of tantalum because the switching current and spinor angle there is roughly you know, inverse uh, relationship. So if you have a large effective spinor angle, you can decrease uh, switching current. So that's why uh, we want to increase this number as much as possible. So effectively, this can be considered the effective spin polarization in conventional STT uh, concept. So once we summarize this uh, spin orbital engineering, we can decompose into three active layers. Uh, the first layer is a generation of spin current. Obviously, we always want to use uh, heavy metals. Nowadays, people start to you know, notice uh, the interfacial effect is getting more and more important. Uh, and uh, I'm going to introduce you some you know, interesting uh, materials, such as uh, topological materials or two-dimensional electron gas. So once we generate, now we have to absorb this uh, spin current. Uh, the, obviously, the first choice is ferromagnet because we know how to make it, you know, how to detect and utilize. Uh, nowadays, you probably heard a lot of anti-ferromagnet-based, uh, you know, research work uh, because of, uh, you know, small fringing field, you know, very high summer stability and so on. Uh, but it's not very easy to detect because the moment is negligible and uh, also it's not easy to fabricate. Uh, so I'm going to introduce some concept of multi-layer and ferry magnet uh, in my talk. Then the capping uh, was largely ignored. Uh, and typically people thought, uh, you know, we have uh, this two functional bilayer, but if you change your capping, you know, oxide or metal, you will change the whole electric field in your structure. So if you change electric field in your whole structure, what will happen? The Lashba coefficient will change because you have, you know, different effective magnetic field experienced by electrons. So basically, uh, we want to, you know, have a system or some kind of materials uh, which can give us very large effective uh, spin or angle or uh, large effective SOT fields. So that is our, uh, you know, some, uh, the motivation. So a spin or angle is a material parameter, and uh, this is a theoretical calculation paper. Intensity of spin or angle as a function of atomic number, you can see there is some kind of linear relationship. So that has you know, we have to use basically heavy elements because that can give us larger uh, effective spin or angle. And if you look at carefully, uh, some material will give us a negative spin or angle, some material will give us a positive spin or angle uh, connected with uh, the outermost D electron, you know, shell filling. Uh, but luckily, some CMOS compatible materials show large spin or angle, like uh, tungsten, for example. This is very widely utilized. Uh, uh, metallization in CMOS uh, that indicate you know, this technology uh, can be incorporated uh, readily in conventional CMOS uh, fabrication process. Then, um, you know, theorists always give us uh, some guideline, uh, platinum is what, tungsten is what. It's really true. Uh, so we summarize all the experimental report from uh, platinum and we see a huge diverse report as small as 0, 0.00 something way up to 0 0.12. And how come it's possible? It's the same material, uh, but you know, people reported very different values. But once we plot as a function of spin diffusion length and spin or angle, interestingly, we see uh, you know, inverse scaling. And this indicate basically large resistivity material, even though it's the same material, if you can tune your grain boundary, you know, annealing condition or argon pressure during deposition, Basically, you can change your uh, materials parameter like resistivity. Then large one will give you large effective spin or angle. So this is kind of a, you know, a rule of thumb. And this is due to kind of a spin dependent scattering. So you inject charge current into your material. Then we want to increase the scattering as much as possible. And you have a lot of different types of scattering, huh? like a, Professor reintroduced a skew, you know, side jump, and whatever, whatever. But once you have more scattering, what will happen? You have also higher possibility to have spin-dependent scattering. Then once you have more spin-dependent scattering, basically you can separate spin up and down in different direction. So uh, that's why large resistivity will give us effectively large uh, spin or angle. But of course, if you engineer too large resistivity, is it good for application? It's no, because you will have huge power consumption. So always you have to think about you know, some optimization. 
in terms of uh, effective spin or angle and device power consumption. So then the next question is, uh, okay, now we understand the spin or angle effective value can change depending on material parameter. Then whether the sign is fixed. So we noticed this interesting paper um, from Masamichu Hayashi Group NIMS in 2013. They measured the effective spin or angle or effective, uh, effective field from tantalum and then Larger thickness typically gives a negative value, which is well known and typical, but as you go down thickness below 0 0.5 nanometer, there is a sign change to positive you know, value. How come it's possible? It's the same material, just changing thickness, you change sign. And this obviously uh, cannot be understood using conventional spin hole theory. So we follow this work and we were able to mimic this from tantalum and we try to look at, let's look at the other materials. So this is example of half a uh, So we start from 20 nanometer, we have a typical negative value, this is expected and normal behavior. As we go down, there is a decreasement of value, like a typical spin hole like, uh, you know, behavior. Below 1.8 nanometer, we see sign change to a positive value. So this is pretty much the same, uh, like this behavior. As you go down, there is a sign change from negative positive, and you can see negative to uh, positive change. So we naively understood, uh, um, you know, this behavior, there is a competing phenomena between spin hole and interfacial spin orbit coupling. If you make a very thick film, this, the, the behavior is dominated by spin hole. It's a bulk effect dominated. But as you make your film thinner and thinner, then, Basically, your interfacial effect you know, overcome the bulk effect, and somehow interfacial effect has a opposite sign to uh, you know, your spin hole. Then probably you can change sign in this way. So that is our uh, naive experimental uh, you know, point of view. And uh, uh, recently, as uh, Professor Lee also showed, we also found if you dope your typical copper ion boron platinum bilayer with oxygen, we can also change sign. So that was also strange. But all this experiment tells us basically the role of interface. If you dope oxygen and at this interface, copper ion boron and platinum, somehow we can trigger more interfacial spin orbit coupling, which has opposite sign to spin on. Then you can effectively change the whole structure's you know, uh, value. So recently we tried to uh, you know, mimic or repeat this experiment in one device. Uh, so we use a gadolinium oxide and the cobalt platinum bilayer. And gadolinium oxide is known to have a, a huge you know, oxygen reservoir. And by gating, you can push your oxygen into cobalt and you can pull back so you can oxidize and you can reduce back and forth depending on the gate you know, voltage. And during this, we also see we can effectively change to positive, to negative, positive, negative, you know, uh, spin or angle. So it indeed proved our previous uh, you know, speculation. Once we can dope uh, this interface with oxygen, uh, we can basically effectively switch uh, the uh, spin or angle sign. But this one also gives a kind of interesting uh, perspective in terms of uh, recomputable spin logic device, because depending on the gating, you can uh, you know, program in different direction. Uh, so that gives uh, opportunity, not only memory, but we can also think about even some possible spin logic device. So we had a collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Nick in uh, California State. He's a first principle calculation person. So he tried to put oxygen at different uh, layer and see which layer is really responsible for this sign change. And then y axis is basically large by coefficient. And then uh, when we put the uh, oxygen, all the way top, and that is corresponding to uh, away from the interface, and we gradually move oxygen in this way. There is some kind of you know, um, modulation in terms of uh, intensity, but as soon as we put the oxygen at this uh, very first interface, then suddenly the sign changes to a negative value. So uh, this calculation indeed indicate this interface is uh, basically very important to change the sign of this observation. Uh, we can also gate our device 
with kind of you know different uh, duration and different voltage and we found uh, it's kind of analog device because the amount of oxygen you can gradually modulate and depending on the amount of oxidation we can effectively change the sign from positive number all the way to zero and even negative and you can go back and so on so this is a kind of analog operation and whenever you see now analog operation there is another important keyword in our in our community that is a neuromorphic uh, device. So we try to use this uh, phenomena and then uh, show some kind of interesting uh, neuromorphic function and there is uh, spike rate dependence that depending on you know how much spike you give to the device basically you can increase your potential more rapidly if you uh, you know slowly uh, give you can sort of you know slowly increase your potential you can also depotentialize uh, the other one is uh, you can also give a two pulse into the device if those two pulse are nearby, basically you have a higher correlation, uh, then you can also change the potential in large amount of you know, magnitude. If two pulse is uh, far away, basically no correlation, and then you have a little effect. So this is called the spike time uh, dependent plasticity, which is sort of an essential feature. Uh, we have to show uh, if this is some kind of neuromorphic uh, device. So indeed, it shows uh, our device can mimic this uh, synaptic uh, function, um, you know, mimicking our human uh, synapse. All right, so let me go back to this uh, SOT. So as I mentioned, ferromagnet was the first choice. Uh, however, nowadays you see this anti-ferromagnet. This is one of the example uh, reported by uh, Thomas Group using copper manganese arsenide. However, right now they only, you know, showed 90 degree rotation. So if you look at by flowing the current, they can change the magnetic magnetization from red to blue, black and black to red. So it's only 90 degree rotation, which is not really compatible with the typical MTJ reading scheme. And uh, due to this, they uh, you know, you use only the anisotropic magnetic resistance to read out. And AMR value is only a few percent. And uh, um, the, the MR percentage is very important for reading operation. If you want to find out what is the information stored in my memory, uh, basically the, the required time is inversely proportional to the MR value. So in this case, you have to read for a long time. And if you typically look at your memory operation, you have to read very frequently compared to writing. So reading time is actually very important, even though you know, we pay too much attention for writing in scientific you know, research, but reading is actually impact, is more important in most of the case. So again, um, you know, smaller value is, is not really compatible with uh, real you know, application. So we try to come up with uh, the concept of multi-layer or ferry magnet in this uh, SOT MRAM. So this is an example of uh, multi-layer. Cobalt palladium is very well known magnetic media. Uh, people you know, uh, worked on our previous hard disk research. Um, and then luckily we had the tantalum on top. So then we tried to measure effective spinor angle and we found enormously large value of four. Uh, and obviously this is very surprising and typically theorists expect uh, palladium cobalt interface, cobalt palladium interface will cancel out and then you end up with the first interface. Uh, but those are very naive uh, theoretical picture. But if you look at real materials, you always have lattice distortion in this palladium cobalt and cobalt palladium interface. And if you grow multi-layer like a 22 times in our case, this strain distortion will accumulate in your whole structure. So basically there is a huge you know, broken symmetry in this multi-layer concept. So we attribute this large effect due to um, you know, broken symmetry due to strain engineering in this uh, multi-layer concept. The other one I want to introduce is the ferry magnet. Uh, Professor Lee also showed the ferry magnet can be very interesting in skirmion or domainal motion, uh, but we utilize this one in uh, spin orbit torque, uh, uh, basically switching. Uh, in this case, this material can you know, be easily grown uh, like a bulk PMA, very thick. In this case, we use uh, six nanometer, but you can easily grow 20, 30 nanometer you know, PMA, no problem. And uh, we uh, use a, a platinum underlayer, and we can study as a function of composition of gadolinium. And we found about 25% of gadolinium is uh, close to anti-parallel alignment. 
in which cobalt gadoliniums are pointing opposite direction. So your moinet moments are compensating closely. And about 20% gadolinium is close to ferromagnet. And cobalt lattice dominate in this case. So once we measure effective uh, SOT field, we see about uh, eight times enhancement. Uh, in case of the switching experiment, we see the switching efficiency increase about nine times. So uh, basically we see about 10 times change uh, in this effective spinor angle once we move from ferromagnet to anti-ferromagnetic coupling regime. And this one we attribute it to, uh, to a negative exchange coupling between cobalt and gadolinium. So if we give a talk to cobalt lattice, basically gadolinium should go, you know, follow to help to maintain the uh, anti-parallel configuration. So this is quite different from the conventional ferromagnet because ferromagnet you have all the same direction. So if you move some lattice, the other one will pull back actually, uh, in a way. Or later uh, we found uh, you know this phenomena can be also understood uh, like a, a bulk-like spin orbit top. Uh, so in this case we use uh, cobalt terbium multilayer, and then uh, the spin dephasing can be maintained much longer distance. Uh, due to this uh, oscillating exchange field in case of uh, this fatty magnetic uh, lattice. Uh, so we can have also very large uh, effective spin of talk about 20 times uh, in this case. All right, so once we have this understanding of uh, you know, quasi-static switching, of course, we want to know dynamic you know, property because in reality, all our application is based on short pulse. Uh, so we try to inject short pulses to this uh, conventional uh, tantalium cobalt ion boron uh, device and look at the spin dynamics using picosecond mock. Uh, we give a short pulse like one nanosecond with a certain current density and nothing happened because your energy is not enough to the device. As we move, uh, you can see about two nanosecond, we can have a full switching from top to bottom. Uh, and uh, if you increase pulse width more than initially switch, but then there is a switching back process. So initially it moves from top to bottom, but it switch somewhere in the middle. So once we plot the probability, as we increase the pulse width, uh, initially we can achieve almost 100% uh, switching, then it go back to about 50%. And this particular behavior we understand uh, due to domain world motion. So when we switch this, uh, uh, you know, the cobalt ion boron, uh, it propagate, then at the end, the domain can be reflected. Uh, and when you deflect, basically you change your phase. So basically we have to understand uh, this uh, domain world dynamics in a lot of, you know, materials because uh, it's not easy to make a single domain uh, uh, due to the PMA nature. PMA material will give you very small, you know, domain size. And in realistic device geometry, we will always have uh, domainal propagation. And now this domainal propagation behavior is a bit complex due to DMI, uh, which I am not gonna talk about uh, too much detail. So we have to understand those. How much time do I have? Um, 10, I think I should be able to finish. All right, so once we have this domainal dynamics, um, we can also think about how to eliminate the external magnetic field necessary for SOT switching. So we can make this kind of dumbbell structure, and then we can uh, pre sort of uh, define our domain world at a particular position, depending on the uh, hysteresis of the magnetic field. Then once you define your domain world, uh, we can apply charge current into this uh, uh, device and move this domain world back and forth without any magnetic field. This one again because of DMI. And the uh, domain world will always stop at this point because the current density in this rounded you know, area is much smaller because of large area. So domain will always stop here if you adjust the amount of current. And you can move back and forth multiple times. You test it in a million times, it never disappear. But like a typical racetrack memory, if you have a multiple domain where and you move, there is some interaction and it's not easy to maintain. But in case of a single domain where we found it's much easier. Right, so then we can easily integrate those with the conventional MTJ on top and you can read out. And uh, due to this, uh, we have uh, some energy saving because we don't need to nucleate the domain where we already predefined. Uh, 
So we can also move at uh, zero uh, current. It's time to wrap up. Five minutes. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, this uh, topological material is also very interesting in the community because of uh, spin momentum locking. So depending on uh, the electron direction, the supported spin is uh, in a right angle, very particular. So people think uh, we should have a giant spin or angle. Of course, uh, many experimental group report a wide range of you know, value, effective spin or angle, as small as 10 to minus 4, all the way to 425. So you can see you know, somebody is doing wrong measurement. Uh, but if you, again, plot as a function of di thickness, we have very interesting inverse scaling. So once you have, it's relatively easy to understand. This material we call insulator, topological insulator, but it's not. It's a very dirty semiconductor. And due to the cellulium vacancy uh, during the material preparation. And where is the Fermi level? Fermi level is supposed to be somewhere in the middle of the gap, but in reality, uh, we have uh, Fermi level all the way up to conduction band. So when you inject charged current, what happens? A lot of current are shunted through the bulk due to this band. And if you have you know, bulk band, there is no such a spin momentum locking property. Right? So forget about this interesting effect. It only happen at the surface. So that's why once you use a very thick film, your spin efficiency will be negligibly small. But if you reduce your TI film less than 10 nanometer, we start to see a you know, huge effect. But of course then, oh, maybe we should use a very, very thin huh, film. Uh, the problem is again, your effective spin or angle is large, but your resistivity again, very large. If you have a very large resistivity, your power consumption, will be enormous, so it's not advantageous. So we have to choose somewhere you know, here to, uh, for device application. So we choose uh, about eight nanometer, and then we put nickel ion on top. Uh, then this is top view using a MOC microscope, and we can look at the domain where you know, propagation and switching, which like charge current, uh, all black domain indicate initially in this direction, we can switch back, and then also uh, applying charge current from opposite electrode, we can switch to the initial configuration. The switching current density is very low. It's a six times to 10 to fifth ampere per square centimeter, typically one to two orders smaller compared to that of heavy metal. Uh, this happened without any magnetic field at room temperature. Uh, so indeed, the uh, topological insulator you know, can be used in uh, probably, you know, possibly some application. And recently, people tried to even deposit this material using sputtering. So if you look at the report by uh, Professor Jinping Wang from Minnesota, uh, they used the sputtering process and they reported also very large uh, efficiency. So I think it's kind of interesting. Then the next question would be, you know, if you have a sputtering and uh, no you know, crystalline structure, whether you can talk about topological you know, density of state. Uh, so I think that is quite an uh, you know, interesting aspect we have to think about. Perhaps uh, it's just all because of very high spin orbit coupling coming from the material. It's probably nothing to do with the topological band. <laughs> so last a few minutes, I just want to introduce a new sort of area called uh, you know, uh, terahertz, what we can offer even you know, spintronics. Uh, traditionally, it's not easy to access because it's in the middle of microwave and the optical band, uh, even though a lot of interesting application were proposed, like a safety surveillance due to smaller you know, wavelengths. After packaging, you can even inspect the IC chip because terahertz can penetrate the plastic packaging. Even some doctors want to use for their you know, medical treatment and so on. But however, I find uh, the most exciting application is uh, detecting black hole using terahertz. So like two months ago, probably you heard the news media talking about uh, human being finally measured this immediate black hole using 0.23 terahertz. This is the frequency you know, can penetrate all the galaxies. Uh, and they use like a six, seven, you know, microscope at the same time. Anyhow, it's a very interesting and the bottle leg is uh, basically there is no real good, you know, room temperature affordable, reliable terahertz emitter. That was the problem. So we noticed this interesting paper uh, by uh, Tobias Campras group in 2013. So they use a cobalt gold bilayer. If you shine femtosecond laser in this bilayer structure, you can generate terahertz. The operation principle is as follows. If you shine laser 
to magnetic material, your magnetic material absorb energy and local temperature increase crazily. During the cool down process, you have spin up and down, you know, diffuse in different velocity. Okay, so if you measure now coming current from the perspective of this heavy metal, you see spin imbalance due to the different diffusion velocity. So that can be considered as a pure spin current. Once you have a pure spin current coming into heavy metal, then you have this inverse you know, spin hole effect that can convert into charge current, and this charge current oscillate in a frequency of terahertz. So it can emit terahertz. So it's a kind of a, it's a non-linear frequency conversion process from hundreds of terahertz to a few terahertz. And typically, this nonlinear process has very small efficiency. Okay? And this one also doesn't have that high efficiency, but that is true for all these nonlinear frequency conversion process. So my students so much excited and came to me. He spent enormous time for materials, understanding interfacial optimization. Uh, then he found uh, a six nanometer tungsten, three nanometer cobalt on top of glass. Substrate is very important not to absorb terahertz. Uh, can give a very high power emission, and we compare with the commercialized uh, zinc telluride crystal. This is a quite expensive gem, uh, half millimeter thick. You can see the power output is almost the same as our uh, thin film, nine nanometer, you know, sputter prepared, uh, uh, you know, device. And uh, he was so much excited about this opportunity and uh, started the company. Uh, so he put all kind of a terahertz component into a small form factor and use uh, fiber-based uh, femtosecond laser. Nowadays, you can buy a very small iPhone size uh, femtosecond laser, uh, you know, operated by uh, fiber optics. Uh, then he can put our terahertz emitter and made a complete uh, terahertz spectroscopy system. And this can be, uh, you know, useful some uh, molecule vibration detection, some thickness measurement, or chemical composition analysis, or even maybe black hole detection, probably, but you have to have probably a lot of those to measure black hole. So as a quick summary, I showed you, you know, what we can do in terms of uh, technological aspect using this interesting spin orbit, uh, you know, uh, phenomenon. Uh, a lot of materials aspect, uh, you know, should be understood. Uh, oxygen content, resistivity, uh, and even this oxygen motion, uh, you know, can be applicable to uh, neuromorphic or spin logic devices. Uh, structural symmetry breaking, multi-layer concept, you know, those can be also applicable to skirmion. Uh, and strain engineering is something we should pay attention. If you look at, you know, conventional CPU, P-type transistors mobility, is engineered by strain engineering. If you look at our laser diode, uh, most of the density of state is modified by strain. Okay? So strain engineering you know, used to be a key ingredient in I think modern electronics and optics, and probably now we have to apply this one in our spintronic devices. Um, as a, some alternative, I think ferrimagnet is somewhere in between you know, uh, ferromagnet and anti-ferromagnet. It's easy to fabricate. It's relatively easy to measure. And if you look at like 20 years ago, magneto optical disc you know, was commercialized. Okay, that precisely used the cobalt gadolinium compound. So I don't think you know, the material is a bottleneck. This material was commercialized and it's time to revisit it in spin orbit of business. And uh, some topological you know, materials are interesting and uh, scientifically we should investigate and nowadays, you know, people even expand to wire or uh, even the two-dimensional electron gas. And uh, finally, using exactly the same structure, but using inverse physical process, we can convert now from spin to charge, and uh, we can generate even terahertz emission. So for this, I want to uh, thank many of my group members who contributed the data I present today, and uh, as well as many international uh, collaborators. Okay, thank you very much. Questions? Uh, thank you, Professor. I have a small question. Uh, just now, you mentioned that topological insulator has a very large spin hole angle, uh, but due to uh, the large resistance uh, difference between the TI and the ferromagnetic layer, uh, when you injecting um, when you inject 
a current into the system, there will be thermal, uh, there will be a thermal gradient along the Z direction. So uh, there will be some thermal effects such as nurse effects or enormous nurse effects. So uh, when you obtain your spin hole angle, have you uh, considered such uh, thermal effects? Sure. So thermal effect always, uh, it, it doesn't really depending on the current direction. Because your you know, thermal effect in the G direction will be same. Either you apply current in this way, this way. So you can always subtract your thermal effect by doing this you know, current direction dependent measurement. And the final output should be purely you know, current direction dependent effect. So you can always uh, subtract those. And in fact, in our measurement, uh, we found the uh, current I mean, the thermal effect is negligible in terms of switching contribution. But in all switching measurement, actually, uh, due to the thermal effect, you reduce your magnetic sort of, you know, uh, anisotropy. So that should be, you know, considered always. Uh, it's, it's impossible to avoid. Uh, so that's why uh, if you do the switching measurement from DC regime, uh, basically, your switching current is always lower because of heating effect. If you now reduce your, you know, uh, pulse width, basically the required current increase, okay, and then, you know, increase crazily. So basically this regime, the quasi-DC regime is uh, like a thermally induced switching regime. And then if you shorten your pulse width, you can go more pure, you know, dynamics regime coming from your uh, magnetic, you know. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, in a fixed ferromagnetic heavy metal bilayer, uh, if the capping layer, oxide capping layer is changed, like MgO or SiO2 or ALO, so due to Rashpa effect, we could expect uh, different spin hole angles uh, for that particular fixed heavy metal ferromagnetic bilayer. That's right, yeah. That's the, I think that is expected. And then I noticed a paper from uh, Professor Kang Wang Group at UCLA, so they use the different capping uh, materials, different oxide or nitride. I think they also showed quite uh, different values. Thank you. But I think the, the understanding is uh, lacking. I think we should look into more details, more systematic study. And even you can put, you know, not only oxide and nitride, you can also put metal. metal. Different metal different will give metal. you also different work function and so on. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, could you quickly give an insight in the concept of the spin hall angle? Because I thought uh, the spin hall angle to be somehow a measurement of the efficiency, how you can convert electrical current to spin current. But therefore, I thought it was like a maximum value there, like one, so you cannot convert um, too much. And now I've, we've seen values over one. So there, I obviously have a misconception of this spin hole angle. Mm. Well, you can consider as a conductivity concept. Uh, for example, as I defined, this uh, spin conductivity but divided by charge conductivity. So uh, when you look at, you know, in a material system, I measure longitudinal or transverse conductivity. My conductivity in transverse direction can be larger than the longitudinal direction then why not the value can be you know, more than one. But if you define as a current, that is the problem because your current should be sort of in a conserved quantity. So you imagine, oh, I injected you know, 10 you know, electrons, then you want to count how many in the lateral and the, you know, uh, transverse direction, then you, you have, I think, the problem. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is the end of morning session. So we'll... Uh... Uh, break for lunch now and we'll be back here uh, at 11.30.